Hey Mr. Lucas, today I'm going to be talking about the calculus in video games and the art of immersion. Video games have a special place in my heart because for the past half of my life uh, I've spent most of my time playing them and also because video games offer a unique entertainment experience unlike any other in the form of immersion. Unlike TV shows and movies, video games give you control of the situation and let you become the character that you are watching. The most basic and most important form of control in a video game is character movement. The first video game, Pong, was a two-player game where all you did was move around a virtual paddle and hit a ball and make sure the ball doesn't pass your paddle. That's all there was to it. Nowadays, there's so much more that you could do to control your character in the game as a whole. Some games let you change your character stats and loadouts so you have a personalized playstyle. Others let you customize the maps or even build your own maps from scratch. Others even let you create your own game modes and change the rules. And some games are just lazy and make you create your own fun. But I'm lazy too. I don't want to spend hours making a game because the game makers to whom I paid 60 bucks didn't do their job. I admit, sometimes it can be fun and there are some games who do it really well, but most of the time I just find myself sitting there and I look around the room and I feel just like some guy at his computer working a boring office job. It doesn't feel like a game. It breaks the immersion. Personally, I'm a fan of single player role playing games where you can explore and choose certain dialogue options that will affect the end of the game. These games allow you to immerse yourself in a living, breathing world and for a brief period, escape reality. So how do they do it? Here's the secret. It's not in the things that you can control. It's in the things that you can't control. Okay, that was confusing and it just contradicted everything I just said, so let me explain. In old video games in the past, when your character died, it was given a set animation for a set scenario. Basically, these pre-animated deaths get really repetitive and annoying, and in my case, after watching it hundreds and hundreds of times, you just didn't want to play the game anymore. The other option would be to create a unique animation for every possible death scenario. However, that would make the life of the animator way harder because there's so many different scenarios and so many things that you could do in a game. It's just impossible to do everything, unless you're the Doom guy. So what's the easiest possible solution to make your death as unique and immersive as possible? The answer is ragdoll physics. Ragdoll physics is better explained with pictures than words, but basically, the character's body becomes limp and moves according to the external forces applied on it. As you can see, it's really silly and stupid looking. However, you never see the same thing twice. Let me explain the calculus behind it. With ragdoll physics, you create a skeleton for a character and use mathematical equations to determine how the skeleton moves when an external force is applied. Imagine a piece of cloth. A piece of cloth is a grid of interconnected points. These points interact with each other based on factors like interactions with other objects, pushing and pulling on it, the external forces like gravity. There are also other factors like the stiffness and springiness of the cloth that determine to what extent the points affect each other. Video games use Featherstone's algorithm and Verlet integration to effectively simulate a cloth and translate that simulation into the skeleton of the character that you are playing as, or the character that you are fighting. First off, what is Featherstone's algorithm? Featherstone's algorithm is a technique used for computing the effects of forces applied to a structure of joints and links, an open kinematic chain, such as a skeleton used in ragdoll physics. That's perfect, okay. Basically, it allows you to figure out how all the parts are affected when one point is moved. Here's an entire slideshow from USC explaining how it works. And now here's me explaining it in lay terms. I have this little magnetic bracelet that's supposed to give you special healing powers or something, but I'm gonna use it for an example. As you can see, there are many links connected to one chain just like the class simulation. Notice how everything is going crazy, and even though I'm moving the pieces up and down, the tiniest difference makes the biggest change. 
This is because the slight differences in movement affect every piece of the chain. So that's how the skeleton interacts with itself in a closed environment, but how does the skeleton interact with external objects in the game world? Here's where Relay integration comes into place. Relay integration goes hand in hand with Featherstone's algorithm, because while Featherstone's algorithm figures out how points interact with each other in a closed environment, Relay integration is used to calculate trajectories of particles in molecular dynamic solutions and computer graphics. It does this by taking the current and previous positions of a point and calculating the next position. Here's the equation. It's a variation of Newton's kinematic equations. This is the particle's position one time step forward and one time step back. Now take a look at this simulation where it demonstrates both Featherstone's algorithm and Verlet integration's effects on a cloth. As I push and pull on the cloth, the particles interact with each other and compress and stretch. That's Featherstone's algorithm. But in the end, gravity causes all the objects to fall back into place. They do this in a fluid motion, and that is the computer simulation running Verlet integration to calculate the future position of each point as gravity is pulling on them. If there was no Verlet, if there was no Verlet integration, the object would just snap back into place like this. So in short, Featherstone's algorithm determines how I, the character, interact with the object, and Verlet integration determines how it, the object, resumes back to its normal state after I'm done playing with it. It is this combination of things that you can control and things that are out of your control which uh, create a true sense of immersion, just like the real world. Now I want to talk about engines. Much like the engine of a car, the game engine is the fundamental driving force of the video game. This is where the graphics, audio, and logic of the game are designed, and it's where all the physics simulations take place. A bad engine will be very buggy and have bad graphics, and a bad company will use the same buggy, glitchy engine for 20 years. Here's some footage of just a few of the glitches from uh, one of the most notorious engines. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay, alright. Was that two glitches in one video almost? Feel like it. <laughs> oh god. Can we edit out the oh, sneeze? Shit. Oh my god! Oh! Oh! I guess we can't edit out the sneeze. Holy that happened shit. That is oh. amazing! Oh my god! What just happened? Yeah. People paid 60 bucks for this game. This is just one of the many reasons why Bethesda's company has become a meme. They deliver unfinished games on a broken engine, and they scam people out of their money. Basically, you need a good engine if you want your game to run smoothly, if you want to have a good game. One of the more popular engines is the Unreal Engine. Just take a look at some of this footage. The portal is open! that Unreal Engine creates such realistic footage is because of real-time ray tracing. And for the purposes of this video, I'm going to just refer to it as ray tracing because non-real-time ray tracing is what they use to create animations and uh, CGI for movies. You're not the only one cursed with knowledge. Anyways, let's let the professionals explain this one. Ray tracing in contrast is trying to do a physical simulation of light and the way to think about it is you know we live in a world where light bounces all over the place and it hits on an object and bounces around diffusing diffracting subsurface scattering things like all that, kinds of right. stuff right but eventually one ray of light makes it into your eye and, and hits your retina and that's what we perceive as vision so what ray tracing is all about is pretending that you're kind of modeling how a retina works and you project forward into the into the scene trying to figure out what other rays have hit the object that's lighting your eye. So ray tracing is all about the physics of light, and when you do that, you get rid of all this um, artistic uh, interpretation that happens with traditional rendering. Right. It might seem strange that ray tracing involves shooting out light beams from the camera's eye back to the light source, but in reality, it's much more efficient because doing it in reverse uh, and calculating it from the light source and tracing it into the camera's eye would require calculating all of the surrounding light beams that go unseen by the camera, and that would waste computer processing power, which is vital for video games to run smoothly. 
However, it makes the lives of the game designer much easier because all they have to do is just put the objects in place, uh, set the colors and shininess of the objects, and the real-time ray tracing, it calculates what it looks like in the game. So that's what ray tracing is, but how does it work? The math behind it. In optics, polarized light can be described using the Jones calculus discovered by R.C. Jones in 1941. Polarized light is represented by a Jones vector, and linear optical elements are represented by Jones matrices. When light crosses an optical element, the resulting polarization of the emerging light is found by taking the product of the Jones matrix of the optical element and the Jones vector of the incident. Light Note that Jones calculus is only applicable to light that is already fully polarized. Light which is randomly polarized, partially polarized, or incoherent must be treated using Muller calculus. The last thing I want to talk about is the simulation of a bouncing ball in video games. And this is often something that goes overlooked and underappreciated, but it is a fundamental feature of many shooting games in the form of grenades. High-skilled players are able to manipulate the bounces of the grenades in order to hit a target around the corner, and even higher-skilled players simply hit the target dead-on. But what's the math behind it? The physics. This one is probably the simplest of the bunch because it just involves kinematic equations and Verlet integration. The only real calculus involved is the derivation of this equation into this equation, and then the Verlet integration to determine the trajectory of the projectile, or the grenade, or the ball, or whatever it is. And then the small things like the gravity and bounciness are all dependent on what the game designers want for the gameplay. This physics can be applied to any movable object in the game, which makes the world so much more malleable and immersive. However, the reason why I bring this up is not to add some arbitrary third example of calculus. <laughs> It's to talk about the importance of all these factors combined and their influence on the immersion of a game. The art of immersion. I want to go back to ragdoll physics for a moment. Dead bodies are just one application of ragdoll physics, but there are so many small things that make the world seem immersive. I first noticed this when I was playing the Overwatch practice range. It's a little map where you can go to shoot these predictable moving bots and improve your aim. This section of the game is very unimmersive. Everything is just moving back and forth, doing exactly what it was programmed to do. After all, they are robots. Until one day, I was climbing around and I noticed this little target up at the top of the map. And I punched it. It blew my mind. I just sat there, punching this thing, and it would react exactly as it would if I was punching it in real life. If I punched it as it swung forward, it would swing farther forward. If I punched it as it swung back, it would stop or slow down. I know it seems trivial, but this is a video game. It's not real life. They could have just programmed it so that when you hit it, it spun around a couple times and made a silly noise, but they actually made it realistic. Then I noticed other parts of Overwatch that were realistically movable. Literally everything. That's when I realized how important it is to create a realistic environment. Not only does it give you something to do while you're waiting for the game to start, but it creates what I call the gamer intuition the gamer intuition. What I mean by gamer intuition is that it's the feeling that you're in another world, but the ability to use real world knowledge and logic and apply it to the gameplay. It is the sense of immersion. Sometimes it's just for fun or aesthetic value like the way plants move or objects break, but gamer intuition can even affect gameplay. That's why you know that if you throw a grenade at a certain angle, you can bounce off this wall and hit a target around the corner that you were unable to hit before. Nobody told you that you could throw the grenades and bounce it. Nobody told you to do that. You just knew it because you took the real world knowledge that you have and you applied it to the video game. And all of this works because of the physics simulations and the math behind the video game that allows these things to happen. If these things weren't in place, everything would just feel blocky and unfun. There would be no room for improvement or creativity. All of the control would be in the hands of the game developers. And that's not fun, because you come to a game to have control. 
and all of these things. The ability to destroy random objects, to move objects and bounce them, to shoot through little cracks in the wall, and to explore. They all add to the realism of the game. Some of the most frustrating things in games is when you think you can do something, but the game doesn't let you. That immediately breaks any immersion, because it removes you from the mindset, and it forces you to remind yourself that you're just some dude sitting on a couch, holding a plastic controller, playing a video game. When all of these factors blend seamlessly, when they create the perfect mix of fact and fiction, when they leave enough room for us to use our gamer intuition, they create a unique world that you can escape to without feeling lost or alone. They create the feeling that you are part of the game world, an emotion, and that is the art of immersion.